Hi folks, and welcome to this brand new series. We're calling it, It's a Fair Question. The good news is that you're not going to have to listen to me too much. On the contrary, I'm going to be meeting lots of people, asking them all kinds of questions about all kinds of things in life. In this first episode, we're going to meet Dan and Julie, both of them who contracted and became very ill with COVID-19. So it's over to them. Let's listen and learn together of their experiences. So I've got two of my uh, colleagues here uh, and I've got Julie, who is minister in Larbert at Larbert West Church, and I've got Dan, who is minister at Bridge of Allen Parish Church. Here's the thing, both of them uh, contracted COVID-19. I just want to hear a bit about that. Julie, tell me what that was like. Uh, first of all, when you found out you'd got it and then how you experienced the condition. Um, so it took a couple of days to work out what it was. Um, my husband actually became ill first with a slightly raised temperature. Um, and we were going, well, do we think it is? Do we think, and, you know, is it on, what else is on the list? And um, I, I had a pain when I was breathing, just very slight awareness. And I was going, and Alice was going, no, it's not on that list. It's not on the list. And so, and then both of us got very high temperatures, um, which made us feel really, really unwell. Um, the, it was the Friday before Palm Sunday. I started the day feeling particularly unwell and spent the day recording the Palm Sunday service. And it was when I was looking back at the recordings that had happened at various points through the day, mm. I could see my color changing, even though I had makeup on, so that by the time I was doing the blessing at about 6 p.m., I looked like death warmed up. And I sent them off to um, my organist, who's the tech guy, and just said, you can see I'm not well. I'll see how I am in the morning. Um, overnight, I became very, very unwell with very high fever, pain everywhere, every one of my joints. I could feel my toes. I mean, it was awful. Um, phoned, the, phoned 111 at around five o'clock in the morning, um, which was a good time to call because you don't have to wait at five o'clock in the morning and um, got through, put through to a triage person who took me through and said, yes, I was definitely symptomatic and um, should therefore be isolating. Um, I have arthritis, which means I take anti-inflammatories. So I expressed concern about the drugs that I was taking and what else I shouldn't, shouldn't be taking. So um, they just said, that's fine. A doctor will phone you and discuss medication, which happened within the hour. And they were absolutely fantastic. Um, and at that point, I just took to my bed. Um, Alistair did not ever get as ill as I did, which was a blessing because we have two Spaniels um, <laughs> who, who needed somebody to let them out. Um, and, and so began that COVID um, adventure. Let me ask you this. Um, obviously, you must have some point in your time had the flu, your kind of regular uh -huh. flu. Um, yeah. Was it on a level with that? Or did you think, oh no, I felt, I felt a lot worse than that? Oh gosh, it was. I had proper flu about two years ago. Um, and I'd, I'd been with, under the doctor for that. Um, proper flu was about maybe 20% of what this was. Okay. This was beyond anything I had ever experienced. Wow. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, and, and just the pain. And when, the, when your temperature goes up, into the, the 38s, well up into the 38s, the almost 39s, your whole body goes into rigor and it's horrible mm -hmm. and it's extraordinarily painful. Well, thank you for, for sharing that and, and we'll come back further. But Dan, let me just ask you, does that sound similar? You know, were you listening to Julie thinking, that's what I felt, that's what I felt? In, in many ways, yes. Um, for me, it kind of started on a, on a Sunday, the first Sunday of lockdown, um, I'd gone into the empty church in the morning just because I didn't know what else to do and just felt a bit sore kind of here and, and didn't feel great. And that kind of got worse through the afternoon. 
uh, spoke to a, a friend who's a GP um, and they sort of chuckled and said, I think you better phone your GP. So I did. And the GP very quickly said, yes, that that is clearly the the start of of COVID. Um, and some of my, my symptoms were, were different from from Julie's. One of the things that was really an issue for me was was the ability to breathe. Um, within it, the, there were a couple of tests done, and I spoke to one 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 a number of times um, through the process, and was taken into hospital and assessed, and and was was sent home because what could have been done in hospital is what I could do at home. But one of the tests that was was given was hold your breath and then count out loud. So you kind of take a deep breath like this and then start to count. One, two, three, four. And and at my worst, I couldn't count to five. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we were all to do it normally now, we could get to get to 30. Um, and it's that I didn't ache in the joints in the same way. But there were points where I felt as if I was drowning in fresh air, no matter what I could suck in, yeah. there was nothing. Yeah. Um, but like Dewey, the NHS, through my own GP, through 111, through the people that I saw at the hospital, and I'm sure we'll come back to that experience because that was horrible, mm. um, were all wonderful. Yeah. But the, yeah, the 33 days at home alone were pretty grim. Yeah. Although I, I wasn't alone. My wife and daughter were with me. Yeah. Well, you talked about the uh, the staff that dealt with you, Julie. You said something similar. People were absolutely great. But then let's just pick up Dan what you said about the experience of going to hospital, and you you, you said that was pretty grim. So do you want to tell us a wee bit about how that was? So, having had symptoms for seven days, quite bad phoned 111 who said okay try this um and if that doesn't work phone us back in three days and i phoned them back in three days um at that point unable to breathe unable to move panicking and was told right we, we need to get you into the hospital um so we we have a, a border terrier we have a four-year-old daughter um my wife and daughter both fell ill as well. My daughter dropped to about 90% of full speed with a tiny cough. Um, and adorably, we taught her to cough into her elbow. And she didn't cough like a normal person into her elbow like this. She does it like this, um, <laughs> which, which is utterly wonderful. And my wife had it, and she had it like a very bad cold, but I, I was the worst. So we were told to go into the hospital. So I kind of was gathering things, I, the phone in my pocket, phone charger in my pocket. Uh, make sure my keys were left at home. And picked up a picture of um, Zoe and Kirsty, um, wife and daughter, and, and we went to the hospital. And we parked up, and you have to phone a, a mobile number, mm -hmm. and then they'll phone you back and say, "Right, ready to come in." Mm -hmm. And I was standing at the at the glass doors, ready to come in, having said a a muted but poignant "I love you" to my wife and daughter as I got out of the car. Because I didn't know whether I was coming back. Mm. My wife said the, the moment that it kind of hit her like a ton of bricks was when she realized that it wasn't our daughter who had put the picture of her and my wife in my back pocket, that it was me not knowing whether I was coming back out. Yeah. And the associated not knowing how I might come back out if I did go in. Yeah. Um, That's really, really poignant because, you know, you've really taken it there to the level of reminding us the fact that, well, we're thankful that you two are here, you're talking about it, but we've lost near 40,000 people at the time of recording across the UK. Julie, um, did it ever play in your mind that actually this is a, a killer? Uh, I mean, did that thought play or did you dismiss that pretty quickly? Oh, no, I didn't dismiss it at all. Um, I had um, about 10 days in, I um, had got to the stage that my breathing was really bad. Um, I, I felt like 
it was as if there was a sponge under my nose that I had to breathe through this wet sponge. And so every breath was just this horrible gasping, trying desperately to breathe. Um, and, uh, and it was particularly bad that, that night. And I was, I was up and trying, trying to breathe, trying to find the best position to be in to ease the breathing. And uh, I thought, should I phone? Shouldn't I phone? Should I go and wake Alistair up? Because at this point, we were in separate bedrooms because we were both unwell and we were both, so we each had a bedroom and we each had a bathroom, which seemed to be a sensible way to do it. You know, should I go and wake him up? Should I not go and wake him up? Um, I really don't know what to do. And then I haven't, I need to write a letter to my sons. That was my thought. Mm. I have to write a letter to my sons because I don't know if I could ever speak to them again. Yeah. And that was terrifying, um, a, a real dark night of the soul moment. And the following morning, I shared that with Dan and he said, you don't get any medals for bravery. Why didn't you phone the hospital? <laughs> um, and and do you, I don't know if you remember that, Dan, but Dan yeah. was kind of my lifeline because I had put it on Minister's Forum. Yeah. And immediately I got so many private messages, but Dan then just because he was about 10 days ahead of me just kept staying in touch and you know how are you doing this morning and um there was one day where we both just basically said at the same time i'm so fed up with this i'm so weary of it mm -hmm. but that particular day when i that night had been so bad and i i hadn't told it i didn't tell anybody else publicly i told dan that and um and he basically told me off <laughs> <laughs> But, but yeah no you do you you consider your own mortality um absolutely it was yeah. and it was a hard hard thing to do yeah thank you for sharing so openly on that julie dan julie used the phrase the dark night of the soul and, and most of us have a sense of, of what that means now we're people of faith you know we're ministers within the christian yeah. church um Let's talk about that for a little bit in terms of faith. I mean, in the midst of it all, um, prayer life, for example, did you find yourself able to pray or, or just so exhausted internally, emotionally, physically that you couldn't even sort of reach out in that way? That's a really difficult question to answer because that, in many ways for me, that kind of calls into question the very nature of prayer. If, if that question is did I kneel by my bed and say my prayers as a cartoon child? No, but that's not how I pray anyway. Um, prayer for me is a, an ongoing openness to God about all the things that are going on. I'm kind of trusting that God knows what I'm thinking, even if I don't. Yeah. So just trying to, yeah. It's really helpful. It's really helpful. I mean, it actually opens the door up for a completely different discussion uh, about the nature yeah. of faith and so on, and maybe that's for another time. Julie, did you um, sense prayerfulness around you? You know, for, for example, colleagues in ministry or family or people in your own congregation, did you sense or, or know that that was there for you? Uh, absolutely, I did. Um, uh, the, the messages that I got from friends that I hadn't heard it from for years um, sent me private messages saying they were praying for me. H hearing that, knowing that was a huge, huge support. Um, we do a daily reflection on the Larbert uh, West Facebook page. And while I was ill, my session clerk did it every day. She faithfully did a Bible reading and a prayer. And uh, every day the prayers were written by different members of the worship team. And I, I watched those most days and knowing that they were praying for me, the congregation was praying for me, was just the most comforting thing. It was really just incredible. I felt it, I, I, I felt it almost physically, this spiritual connection with the people who I knew were praying for me, that even when I couldn't form prayers, um, I love the verse in Romans 8, you know, where the, the, the groanings of our soul are lifted to heaven by the Spirit. That's how it felt that I didn't have words, but I didn't, that didn't mean that I wasn't praying. Yeah. So that, that was a, you know, really comforting time.
I would yeah, echo that. Yeah, Dan, come ahead. Sorry, Dan. yeah, I, I, I would echo that. The sense of people praying for us mm. in, in a normal day-to-day -day way certainly helps me in my ministry. But people reaching out, the people who I didn't know then and have got to know, people showing that they cared, that we mattered just because we are people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that overwhelming outpouring of true Christian love, just mm -hmm. it's unbelievable. It was and wonderful. so helpful. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you both shared in those terms because that should be an encouragement for ordinary folks. But prayer matters. You know, it matters. It's a wonderful uh, sending out of, of love and care and compassion and, uh, and, and bringing it all before God. Um, Dan, I, I guess I'd come into that category. I don't think I knew you at all beforehand. Yeah. So I really don't know you. Uh, you know, I don't know if you're introvert, extrovert, how you function as a person, but how, how was it just basically being in your house for all of that time? In some ways, and this is going to sound slightly perverse, my wife and I were both very glad that all three of us got it. Mm. Because it meant that we weren't isolated within our own house. We we spent a lot of time, the three of us, piled in bed, watching cartoons, me probably asleep, or time passed strangely in those times. Mm. But the three of us together, and arguably my wife and daughter are my favourite people, so being kind of stuck with them wasn't too bad surrounded by wonderful people um the church and community responded greatly to the need in the village so people every other day bringing as as much paracetamol as they could buy um as, as we went through it at an astonishing rate so people dropping things off to look after us yeah. mm. but also that ridiculous privilege of living in a reasonably sized house where you can be together and separate in both inside and outside, where the dog can be exercised by throwing a ball the length of the garden and come back. Yeah, yeah I'm hugely aware of the privilege of the house and the garden that we have that made it far easier yeah. um, to be isolated in that way. Let me just ask you this slightly cheeky question, but I, it just amuses me to think maybe uh, at the beginning, before it was clear, was there any accusations? Oh, man flu, man flu. <laughs> there wasn't. Um, there wasn't in the slightest. Um, I've had various things over the past few years, including quite severe nerve damage in my back, which has required a couple of small operations and at one point, two and a half years ago, left me in a hospital bed, not knowing whether I'd walk out of this or not. Um, so have to be acutely aware of what illness and what pain feels like. Um, and I'm instructed greatly to report back to Kirsty about what is happening so we can continue to, to make sure things don't go wrong. Um, so fortunately, no, no accusations of man flu in the slightest. At least um, Julie, um, okay, you look fine. You know, I'm, I'm chatting to you here uh, digitally, of course, but you look fine. But do you feel fine? I mean, you, you're sort of back through it, but are you over it? That's a really interesting question because, um, according to the, you know, the, all the stuff that you read, you know, you isolate for seven days and then you're better, which is nonsense. I was ill for around three weeks. At the end of the three weeks, I could do, um, I could maybe work for a couple of hours in the morning and then that would be me for the rest of the day. Now, so where are we? It's um, June, the beginning of June. So um, I've probably been w well for six weeks, more or less. Um, I can function pretty much through the day. I, um, I'm exhausted by the end of the day. Get to seven o'clock at night and I'm done. I sit and pretend to watch television and fall asleep. Yeah, yeah. Um, my sleep pattern is very, very disturbed. Um, I'll be up 
three or four times in the night. Um, and that's just, and apparently that's normal. That is just how it is. Um, it, it, it's, these are things that just stay on. Um, I still very occasionally get a little spike of temperature um, at night in particular. And that's one of the things that will waken me. Um, and it goes away very quickly. But again, apparently these are all completely normal. It's just part of the what it leaves behind in your system. Um, if there's very cold wind, I can't go out because it just makes my, my lungs hurt too much. So while it's been warm and calm, it's been fine. The last couple of days when the weather's been a bit colder, um, going out with the dogs, I've had to really keep my, my mouth and face covered um, with a scarf because the cold air still hurts. So. You mentioned it was June and what you said at the beginning there. I'm glad you did. A, I'm looking out my window right now. There are hailstones <laughs> thrashing down in my garden right now. So, hey, uh, stay indoors for now. Dan, could you put it on a scale of one to ten of, you know, if ten was, yeah, I'm 100% back to normal, fighting fit. So where, where would you put yourself if you had to pick a number? I have no idea. Um, in the beginning of January, I was unable to walk because of pain in my back. I had a, a huge amount of steroids put in late January, mid-February. Um, that kind of, I had my couple of weeks after that was starting physio, was starting to feel good. And then I felt this pain in my chest. Um, and it's just been an utter rubbish start of the year. I, I'm sure we can all think of other words to put in there, but but rubbish seems appropriate in this format. Um, but like like Dewey, the mornings are kind of okay. At the moment, speaking to you, I'm a bit sore here, but the fever spikes, the need after lunch to go and lie down for between an hour and four is very present. Um, Quite often, I'll say I'm just going to have half an hour and I'll be woken up two hours later by a small child coming in to see what I'm doing. It's, I guess, that maybe somewhere around a six out of ten might be, might be reasonable. But, yeah, it's, it's a long journey afterwards. I, I was ill for 33 days um, in that kind of, yeah. I, I, by the end of 33 days, I'd had three days without paracetamol. Mm. And, that, and that's kind of the, the marker. If you can go three days without paracetamol, you are well. Yeah. Um, but but you know, long road. Um, the, the, the damage that's been done in this part of my lung by, by the infection yes. that has to repair, the, the damaged dead cells that have to be ex excreted in some way either through the chest or through the blood it, yeah it casts a long long shadow mm. okay well listen i'm sure that both of you and i really want to thank you for sharing so openly i, I found it very moving to hear both of you talk and uh, i guess you would be among those who would be wanting to cry out to society please folks be really careful we do not want a second spike uh, if that can be avoided, we do yeah. not want to be back in that place. Speaking from the experience of having been very badly affected, as you've described. So I want to yeah, really thank you for sharing so openly uh, for how it affected you. It's been instructive, emotive, and uh, it just encourages me all the more to be continuing to pray for you two, as I have been. Uh, and, for, you know, and for the whole church family to be praying for those who have struggled and yeah. those who are caring for in the whole mix. You want to just finish with you know, a last thought, a last wee word or a sentence? Stay at home and wash your hands. <laughs> <laughs> the way I um, sign off when I'm doing my daily broadcasts or my Sundays, I say, I always say, and I say every day, I say, stay well, stay safe and be blessed. Well, that seems like a perfect way to finish up. Practical advice and a word of blessing. Good enough for me. Thank you guys for sharing so openly. Thank you very much and bless you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Well, I'm very grateful to Julie and Dan for sharing so openly with us as they did there. 
and being open to some fair questions. What I'd like to do now as we finish up is just take a moment to pray for them and for all who have suffered from this condition. So, if you will, join me as I pray. Loving Lord, we thank you for Julie and Dan and their families that you have brought them safely thus far. But we continue to pray for them as the road to recovery will be a long one. We pray for all the others across our communities, across this nation and to the far sides of the earth. We pray for all who have suffered from COVID-19. We remember the many bereaved families right now and those who are still ill. We're thankful for our health service and all who have come to the front line ready to serve. Most of all, we turn to you, asking that you would guide us safely through what remains of this pandemic. We ask that you would help us to be vigilant and to understand the seriousness of the condition. And so we turn to you in this as in all things, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, folks, I hope you'll join me next week for the next episode of It's a Fair Question.